welcome to the MLOps community. Thanks for coming on. It's been a while since our last one. I'm excited everybody's here. We have a very exciting session today. Obviously, in the large language model space, things are getting huge. People are very excited. There's a lot to do, a lot to see. And we have somebody who is really a professional in the space. His name is Mark, co-founder and head of AI at Primo. We're going to learn a lot about fine-tuning large language models, the challenges, how to kind of get started in this space, how to advance in that world. And I'm going to drop a chat uh, in, in the chat, a link to an event that's coming up. If you're interested in large language models, if you're interested in all of these kinds of tools, we're going to have a full event, LLMs in production. We have over 50 speakers coming. People will be there. It'll be fantastic. You'll get to see Demetrios hopefully play a little bit of guitar. Um, but yeah, so check that out. Register as soon as you can. And without further ado, we'll bring Mark on. Thanks for coming. Hey, Ben. Thanks for having me on. Really excited to uh, chat to the community and just knowledge share about um, kind of the best practices and what we do at our company. Yeah, awesome. Um, so I'm going to let you jump right into it because we unfortunately are 10 minutes under uh, schedule today. We're going to have a 50 minute session. So I'm going to let you get going. I'll jump in if there's any questions from the audience and then I'll jump back on at the end and we can chat about what uh, you taught us. Sure. Um, so obviously everybody came here to learn how to use open AI APIs, right? Um, I, I'm just kidding. Uh, obviously the, 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 the chat today is to talk about how you can fine tune uh, large language models. The implication there obviously is that you'll be using um, open source based models. Uh, within there, I think that there's a lot of uh, momentum within the community to understand what the best practices are and also um, how do you contextualize and understand when you, the smaller, more traditional models might actually be uh, more appropriate for your use case? So I'll just get into it. I'll, um, so Primo, what we actually do is we, we make it really easy to build and deploy fine-tuned models. And um, our mission is to kind of help democratize um, the accessibility for all these models and allow people to ship um, AI-powered applications. Um, I'll just start off with helping to contextualize uh, what the approaches are for embedding um, large language models or language models into AI-powered applications. Um, at the top in the first set of models I'd want to talk about are uh, closed source models. Um, everybody's pretty well aware of these. Uh, you have OpenAI with GPT-4. Um, you have Cohere, you have Anthropic, Claude, um, and Google themselves have just uh, put their uh, head into the ring with um, Palm 2. And these closed source models are typically accessible um, only through endpoints and APIs um, where they just provide the completions or um, provide embeddings for you. Uh, and um, they tend to be of, you know, pretty large orders and orders of magnitude larger than most other uh, models in the open community. The second set of models uh, that you probably would try to um, embed into your applications are uh, fine-tuned open source models. Uh, it's actually been quite exciting over the last uh, one to three months to see um, how fast the community has been jumping on to fine tune a lot of uh, base models. Um, two examples that have recently come about are um, StarCoder, which was a collaborative effort uh, with ServiceNow and Hugging Face, I believe, with um, in their big science uh, group. Uh, they've released both the base model and the StarCoder fine tune coding model. Um, and then also Replit uh, just released uh, their own uh, codex, um, which is uh, fine tuned as well. Um, the final set of, uh, models that you probably approach are, um, small specialized models. Um, I kind of like to joke and, and think of them as the, the Sesame street of, uh, models because you have Bert and then all his descendants. Um, and, uh, you know, these are, uh, a lot smaller and, and, and have, uh, very specific use cases. The focus of today's talk, obviously, since everybody came here about fine tuning, um, will be mostly the, the, the second set of models. Um, and, uh, 
uh, I'll, I'll just start off right now and let's go into a, a bit more detail on the closed source models. So, um, we have a lot of users that come to us and actually, um, you know, they're, they're fairly new to the field and they, they kind of ask, uh, why can't I just use open AI and, and have like a GPT for, um, you know, medical GPT for pharma, uh, GPT for X, these use cases. And, and they want to go towards the best in class, um, models, uh, start off with the best in class and then see where you go from there. Um, well, the unfortunate part about that is actually that the only models that are available for fine tuning are the older base models. Um, this is taken directly from their fine tuning documentation online and uh, from OpenAI. And uh, the only available models are actually uh, four different flavors and they actually um, are in different sizes. Um, and they tend to be, or they are uh, all just GPT-3 uh, variants. Now, uh, other than the fact that you can only have those types of models, why would you actually want to have um, custom uh, large language models over closed source models? I think the, the main aspect, um, the main three aspects that you want to think about are uh, model ownership. Um, practically speaking, you own the 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 you know the 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 company's uh, intellectual property within the model, as well as being able to control um, the SLAs that this model is sitting behind. Um, a lot of times, uh, you have a product, and um, just because OpenAI's uh, uh, endpoints are down, or uh, Cohere, or any of the model providers are down, you won't necessarily be able to um, uh, uh, meet the SLAs or the demands because you're routing. Um, and sitting behind uh, uh, the endpoints themselves. So uh, model ownership and be able to have those in production are actually pretty important for delivering an AI-powered application. Um, now, the second aspect is actually domain expertise. Uh, as with any person or as with any um, enterprise, it's all about being a subject matter expert. So um, having a custom LLM that's fine-tuned will allow you to uh, have that expertise within the set of tasks that you actually care about and actually drives the business value um, of your company. Now, the final bit is sort of obvious, but uh, it's actually probably one of the most important aspects of having custom fine-tuned uh, models. Um, and that's security and privacy. In a lot of uh, sensitive environments, it's just not really possible to be uh, move data around or um, uh, in healthcare, for example, HIPAA compliance really precludes you from um, being able to send over data to some other endpoint and in, 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 um, not being able to govern the, the set of data that this model is being trained on or the completions that this model is creating. So um, particularly in finance and healthcare, you, you need the custom models in order to ensure your security and privacy. So I'm going to go into finally um, where small models actually work well. Um, they work really well for simple tasks. I think that um, they became state of the art for a particular reason. And the, I just have some examples up here in this table um, taken from Papers with Code, which <clears throat> is a really great resource. I actually recommend everybody to uh, go over and look for that, uh, go over to that website and, 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 and play around and, and look around for all the benchmarks and the resources that they provide. Um, it's about the first thing that I go to to understand um, if my task is sort of oriented in a particular way where, um, in what the benchmarks and state of the art is, um, and you'll understand from here that, um, there's not a lot of reason to go for a large language model when your task is just really simple because these models are already, these small models are already state of the art and they're, uh, basically in a, uh, they've already solved the problem that they're in task that they've, uh, been, uh, dedicated to um, perform on, and you're getting near perfect performance anyways through those. Um, why do you need to scale to orders of magnitude larger um, for a large model? So um, now that we've kind of gotten through contextualizing um, the kind of three approaches and the three types of uh, models that you want to work with, um, let's go a little bit more into fine tuning. Um, I think uh, for me and for a lot of folks, um, you can break down fine tuning into, uh, four different categories. Um, 
for one, it's like multitask fine tuning where you actually want uh, the model to perform on a on a range of tasks, uh, and you'll you'll have data sets that are very specific to uh, encompassing this ensemble of tasks. Um, you can do few shot fine tuning, which is actually to include um, uh, training data that has examples. So each set of each example has a few shots of or few exemplars within them, um, as well as their completion. And then uh, you kind of have domain specific uh, uh, fine tuning where you want it to you want the model to perform particularly well um, on a on a particular subject matter. And then you have prompt based fine tuning which is actually going to be the primary focus of today's talk, uh, mostly because it, um, you've seen that instruction fine tuning recently has been sort of the state of the art approach in terms of creating the right interface to expose uh, a state of the art performance on downstream tasks. I'm going to go through a few strategies for improving fine tuning performance. Um, at a high level, I can kind of break them down into really wanting to define your task. Um, prompt engineering, and then how do you uh, efficiently fine tune um, uh, models? Here's the first set of challenges that I sort of think of. Um, in terms of starting with a, a model, oftentimes, uh, let's say you want to go with a really large model like DaVinci uh, from OpenAI. From there, gathering the data involves either going for quantity, in which case you might go for a third party. Uh, data vendor to provide synthetic data in a large volume of it. Um, or you want to go for quality and you will go with human labeling, um, which is a lot more arduous. This usually leads to four different paths that you'll take. Um, and uh, this is what I often see in terms of the, the final scenarios that occur um, for uh, individuals who approach it this way. Um, you'll often get like the wrong format of data. So uh, it's not going to be instruction data. It may not even be um, really well formatted to be able to be consumed by the model itself either. Uh, secondly, you might have poor quality data. It might be just misaligned with the goal and the, the, the primary task that you want it to perform. Uh, and it just won't be uh, uh, performing at what you think would be state of the art. Uh, finally, um, for human labeling, you either get too few examples, um, in which case you actually can't even reasonably fine tune. And it's been shown that um, on too few examples that uh, fine tuning is a bit unstable on the downstream tasks and the performance will be um, uh, less predictable. And then you may find that it'll be way too expensive. Uh, paying a bunch of human labelers um, is actually pretty expensive in order to get the sufficient amount of examples that you want to fine tune on. One of the solutions and what I actually um, encourage everybody to do is to define your tasks really clearly. It, within a, a framework at our company, we like to think about how um, we break down the different task types. So fundamentally, we like to separate them out into knowledge-based and reasoning-based uh, tasks. And for knowledge-based tasks, assuming that you actually want the capabilities of a large language model, it'll either be wa um, wanting to fine-tune it to be able to perform a wide range of uh, fairly simple tasks, or you want it to be really good at performing a uh, really complex, uh, a few specific complex tasks. Um, on the reasoning side, you can break it down into either coding or math. Obviously, there are other um, types of uh, reasoning capabilities, but um, focusing on coding and math, you can understand that for the coding aspect, you want it uh, to be performant at code generation or being able to explain and debug code. Um, and on the mathematics side, it's uh, more... Uh, an exercise in being able to um, embody axiomatic, axiomatic uh, logic uh, and reasoning and, and, and start to learn higher order abstractions from there. Now, once you kind of have an idea of your task frameworks, um, I actually recommend that everybody go towards um, uh, Stanford's new initiative called Helm, which is the holistic uh, evaluation of language models. 
um, it was kind of the first of its kind uh, to standardize and um, uh, evaluate models on a number of scenarios, holding fix the prompt, holding fix the task. Um, and it's kind of a living, breathing benchmark for everybody to go to, um, to understand, uh, what the state of the art is in terms of the models and also to, um, figure out what tasks that you're actually interested in, uh, 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 benchmarking and using for, um, fine tuning your model on. So you want to go from the task and, and then work backwards from there. One little trick that, uh, is actually pretty interesting and important within figuring out your tasks is to use task clustering um, to, to actually diversify the training data because it's actually been shown to improve out of domain performance. So um, the visual that I provide is actually just um, a, a breakdown that's taken from the, the FLAN paper that was released about two years ago. Um, in that paper, they actually showed that if you can uh, uh, train on, um, a diverse set of, uh, clusters of tasks. Um, it will perform, uh, inference on out of domain tasks even better versus if you don't actually have a wide diversity of task clusters in your fine tuning training data. Um, I will point out that one caveat to that is the fact that, um, the model needs to be fair, uh, fairly large, well, large ish. Um, so it needs to be probably greater than about 10 billion parameters, um, in order for you to kind of see that type of, uh, behavior coming out of it. Once you've kind of identified their task and then have all the task clustering, um, I would suggest thinking about prompt engineering. Um, I know that prompt engineering has kind of a, a certain connotation today, but, um, I'm going to take you through, uh, how we think about it and how you can approach it in a rigorous fashion. I think maybe we should talk about how uh, or what a prompt actually is. Um, at a high level, what you can think about is a prompt is comprised of uh, three properties. You have the meta prompt, you have the template, and you have the exemplars. Um, the meta prompt uh, is actually used in some uh, strategies or, or some techniques that I'll actually elaborate on in a couple slides um, to come up with um, more data. So you can actually prompt the large language model to synthesize more data. So um, within the meta prompt, uh, an example would be uh, to come up with a series of tasks. So you're actually uh, asking a, a model with a high level instruction to come up with uh, more tasks um, um, as part of its completions. Once you kind of establish the meta prompt, um, you can establish uh, the template that you'll be using. Um, if anybody's used Langchain, they have a bunch of templates there as well. Um, I just provide a specific template that is uh, shown in the self-instruct paper um, that I'll go over in a second. Um, so you want it to come up with a series of tasks, and then you have a template for um, having uh, eight tasks that you actually provide it, and then you leave the ninth task blank for the model to uh, fill out. So once you kind of have the template, you actually fill in the tasks themselves. So these are the exemplars. And then I just have some examples here of exemplars that you'd be using uh, in order to generate um, um, uh, more tasks themselves. Um, so here's uh, once you have the prompts that you actually want to use for your instruction fine tuning, um, you often are hit with a bottleneck where it's actually kind of difficult to, uh, construct like, you know, thousands of prompts, right? It takes too much human time. It's the same, uh, problem you kind of, uh, run into for human labeling. So, um, we actually, uh, typically use certain synthetic data techniques and I'm gonna, um, elaborate on a particular technique that we like a lot, uh, which is, uh, self-instruct. Um, so. In order to synthesize more data, you can use the self-instruct uh, approach to seed the tasks. So um, examples of them are back here. So you basically come up, you have a series of tasks, and then you seed it and uh, enter these tasks into this prompt, and you feed it back through a task pool in this pipeline in order to generate more tasks. Um, at the end, what you actually use, so uh, not every single generation of tasks is going to be uh, viable for you to use in your fine tuning process. 
but then you have some a filtering mechanism um, in order to decide whether or not you're going to keep these set of tasks or not uh, that are generated from the model in itself. So basically, seed the seed a large language model with a set of uh, human uh, curated tasks, and then run it through uh, uh, self-instruct in order to produce uh, more tasks. Um, in the paper, it actually is able to generate um, 82,000 task instances from just 175 seed tasks. Um, why this is important is actually within the, the industry right now, um, this is the exact method that um, uh, some uh, that Alpaca used uh, to fine tune Llama and um, a lot of other descendant models that have, um, you know, ar arisen in the last couple months for fine tuning and getting more training data out of it. So um, I, I can provide some tips actually specifically for uh, prompt engineering. Um, within there, I would say that uh, for your prompts, <clears throat> you should typically want to focus on the rationales um, over the correct answers. So if you think about it, um, it's sort of like taking a, a, a math exam. Um, it's not about getting the right answer. It's actually about having the right reasoning path and adopting the right reasoning pattern to be able to apply <clears throat> on a lot of other questions. So um, just having, you know, in traditional machine learning, what's important are the labels when you have X and Y. But in uh, large language models, what's actually more important is to figure out the reasoning path and providing that to the model so then that it can learn better. Um, I sort of alluded to it uh, before, but um, another tip would be to push the context limit for these examples. Um, it's actually staggering how much longer the context limits are these days. Um, I think Claude just released, uh, just updated their model uh, from Anthropic, uh, where it can now take in a context length of 100,000. Um, that's pretty staggering. But if you can push the context limit, you're basically providing more examples. And uh, this goes back into few shot learning or in context learning, in which case you actually help contextualize what you want the model to do a little bit better. And then finally, a uh, final tip I would really have for everybody is to try to flip the script. Um, you can actually get the model to generate the rationale for you. Um, one uh, area of study or one um, new uh, kind of strategy that has come about is a chain of thought reasoning, um, where you can use it to uh, make the model provide what reasoning path it used in order to get to its answer. And um, that's actually really helpful for uh, increasing the model's capacity to learn on your specific task. So I kind of went over um, a bit of the uh, data-centric approaches um, for improving your fine-tuning uh, uh, experience in, in, in quality. Um, once you've kind of established how to get all the training data and also how to make your uh, training data in the form of instruction prompts, um, you actually have to go about training the model. So uh, this is more about um, uh, training efficiency, and I'll provide some guide guiding principles and, 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 and introduce a technique to help you uh, train and fine tune more efficiently um, for your use case. Let's go through um, kind of an exercise to figure out what the memory footprint of um, fine tuning would be for a 15 billion parameter model. Um, I'm just going to apply pretty naive uh, data parallelism data parallelism here uh, with mixed precision. Um, PyTorch comes shipped with uh, uh, distributed data parallel. It's really easy to use. Um, and also all um, NVIDIA GPUs actually have uh, basically mixed precision baked in as a as an option and it's shown to have um, you know better quality uh, results uh, without or it's, it's shown to have more efficient training uh, without any degradation in in, in results um, so let's go into the the 15 parameter model a billion parameter model here so the first set of uh, memory that you have to allocate um, is the uh, weights of the model so uh, you have 15 billion parameters, and then you have two bytes that you have to allocate per uh, parameter in the model. Um, this is because we're using half precision there. 
there's actually no free lunch, unfortunately, even though it's called <clears throat> mixed precision. Um, it does reduce the memory footprint, but you still have to keep a master copy of the model uh, in memory. So that's about four bytes per 15 uh, for each parameter in the model that you have to keep in the uh, training process, the fine tuning process. Um, what actually occupies most of the memory is the optimizer states. Um, those have to be kept in full precision. And if you're using something like Atom, you need to keep the state of, uh, the two states that are momentum and variance, um, in memory. And, um, that actually, uh, you just take a really huge, uh, uh, hit there from having to, um, keep those, uh, states in, in, in memory. So finally, you actually have to, uh, uh, keep the gradients at full precision as well. So that actually amounts to 270 gigabytes of VRAM, and that's not even including activations. So you're actually looking at having to have four 80 gigabyte A100s, and um, we're sort of in a GPU shortage today. So uh, good luck trying to either allocate those GPUs and then paying for them because they're going to be really expensive. Um, there are some strategies in, in um ways of doing offloading in order to improve your training efficiency. If, if you want to do some further reading, there's actually a post um, that one of my scientists, Lucia, uh, has uh, on Medium, and she goes through uh, how do you think about um, uh, uh, resolving the bottlenecks that you'll, you'll um, encounter in mixed precision training. Let's move on to actually the solution that I suggest. Um, you have, you know, naive data parallelism, um, but when you want to fine tune a model, um, oftentimes uh, you can think about having to take context target pairs and then wanting to, um, you, you want to um, optimize the, the objective function uh, in order to um, be more well tuned to a downstream task. So uh, in this visual, this is taken from the actual uh, low rank adaptation uh, of large language models paper, the LoRa paper. Um, what is actually happening um, in the summation is that you're taking some language model and you are um, optimizing it through, uh, you know, uh, a backpropagation in order to make the objective function, you're trying to minimize the loss on the objective function in order to um, uh, optimize it for downstream tasks. Um, you don't actually need all of the initialized weights. Um, you actually just need to uh, incrementally change the weights by some delta. So that's sort of what I have over here. Um, let's go into a little bit more detail. So you can actually reformulate what you would find in full fine tuning, which is when you want to move out, when you want to change all of the weights in the model um, to freezing a portion of the weights. So uh, if you look over here, this was the original full fine tuning formula. And then in the paper, the authors actually reformulate it into a combination. Um, so how do we think about this? So do you remember, if you remember from back propagation, you have your forward, uh, backward and, uh, update steps. So within the update, um, uh, aspect of your, uh, modeling, you actually break down, um, the update into, um, a set of frozen weights, uh, and then, uh, a set of weights that you actually want to change. Um, so then you actually can break down the set of uh, weights you want to change into uh, a lower rank matrix uh, multiplication that will be applied to um, uh, to the set of frozen weights. So um, in, in a way, it's actually um, subtraction by addition. Um, you have to add more parameters into the process. So it it's so kind of interesting that that would reduce the memory footprint and actually reduce the amount of parameters that you need to deal with in the um, in the fine tuning of your model. Um, but this is because uh, what happens is that with um, a choice of your rank, so um, intrinsically downstream tasks uh, are a lower rank. So 
what does that, that mean? That means that rather than needing um, every single weight, uh, the entire dimensionality of this large language model to perform well on the tasks that you care about, you can actually reparameterize it and uh, map it down into uh, a set of weights that actually uh, matter more for your tasks. So um, that is where the aspect of rank comes into play. And um, oftentimes what you actually do is you could map a 1 billion parameter model into a rank of uh, eight for your fine tuning process using LoRa. So um, this leads to a extremely large reduction in the memory footprint uh, of your model when you need to um, fine tune it. Um, so, uh, you know, given that set of principles, you can actually use LoRa to um, uh, reduce the memory footprint in, in, in fine tune in a more efficient manner. So uh, right here, um, we kind of break down the objective function into the frozen parameters and also the lower rank set of parameters that you want to um, fine tune. There's a few caveats to this and things that I want to note for um, fine tuning using LoRa. Um, the decomposition actually, it, it can only really be applied to the attention layers. Some folks have tried to apply it to um, the fully connected layers and uh, more often than not, it's really applicable towards the the key and the value matrices. If you if you're kind of familiar with attention, um, those are the representations of the query, the key, and the value uh, matrices. Um, another thing to keep in mind is actually that higher rank is needed, um, and therefore less reduction in parameters uh, when the downstream tasks are more dissimilar. So um, the pre-trained language model is trained on a particular corpus. So um, if the corpus of the tasks that you actually want it to perform better on uh, in your fine-tuning process are pretty different from the inherent corpus that the language model was pre-trained on, you actually need to increase the rank. So the rank is the parameter R, and therefore um, you're not going to see as uh, drastic of a, a memory reduction benefit from using LoRa. Um, Maybe the final kind of interesting aspect of applying a primary efficient fine tuning method like LoRa is, um, is that it, it can outperform full fine tuning in some regards, in some use cases. So um, that's actually because um, we talked about the intrinsic rank of uh, some downstream tasks. Um, you can think about it as, as if you were focusing the model more on the particular context of uh, tasks that you care about. And therefore, um, fine tuning a frozen, uh, uh, only a frozen set of weights um, using LoRa will help it perform better on those tasks themselves. So um, I'm just going to bring it back to the back of the envelope uh, calculations. Um, there's a lot of li there's a few libraries out there that folks can uh, leverage uh, to do parameter efficient fine tuning, but um, when when you apply LoRa, and let's presume we use a rank of eight, um, the only thing you actually have to really keep in memory are the the uh, half precision model parameters. And in some cases, some people like to go to even lower uh, quantization for that. But um, the rest of the other parameters actually just uh, become tens of megabytes, and you'll see about a seventy eight percent reduction in the uh, memory footprint um, of the of the model. So uh, that actually means you could effectively fit it on one, you know, uh, 80 gigabyte A100 GPU rather than having to have four. Um, obviously, there's some overhead that may cause you to, um, you know, have out of memory errors. So keep that in mind. Um, there are other actually other tricks to reduce the memory. So I only talked about lower because I think it's the most approachable one that allows you to get the most benefit when you're fine tuning. But um, you can also shard the gradients, the optimizer states, and the model parameters. Um, good examples of that are, are deep speed stage three, as well as uh, fully sharded data parallel. So uh, I actually just want to summarize kind of what we've got, uh, what I went over. Um, and the, the, the 
the things to keep in mind when you want to, um, some best practices you want to keep in mind when you want to fine tune. Um, first thing you want to kind of do is, like I said, you want to define your tasks and you really want to leverage task clustering. The diversity of the inherent uh, training data that you're using will allow you to perform better on out of distribution tasks and also uh, allow you to train uh, your model to actually perform the exact things that in, in, uh, in perform the capabilities that you actually want it to do. Um, the second thing you can kind of do is, you know, put after you've put all your data into uh, an appropriate format, you can use self-instruct or similar methods out there um, to generate more data. So you can use the model or another model to help you generate more training data so that you can actually fine tune on. And um, finally, um, you can apply parameter efficient techniques to reduce the memory footprint of the model and also combine it with learning techniques so that um, you can actually uh, do it in a reasonable amount of time and have more efficient fine tuning to make it possible. So um, it's really a combination of uh, best practices for um, getting the best quality results as well as having the, the most efficient um, uh, training process when you're fine tuning. Um, that's really all I really wanted to, to, to talk about today, but, um, I think, um, you know, we can open it up for, for some discussion and some questions now. Awesome. That was fantastic. Thanks so much, Mark. Um, well, yeah, so the chat is open. If anybody has any questions, uh, we're happy to answer them. Um, but you know, while we're waiting for, for everybody to come in and, and fill in the questions, I'm sure we'll, we'll get a lot. Um, can you just tell us a little bit about kind of where you came from your journey, how you got excited about LLMs and, and kind of deep in the space of LLMs? Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, I kind of started out as a um, machine learning researcher uh, at a few uh, enterprises. Most recently, I was at Splunk looking uh, in searching and seeing analytics. But uh, I always felt like searching and deep learning is just very hard. And then with language models, it just became that much harder. <laughs> so uh, I think um, what we've actually seen and what really interested me um, to, to kind of start a company and, and go down this journey was that um, we used to think about traditional machine, traditional machine learning was uh, thinking about, hey, let's start out with the simplest model and then start adding more capacity to it in order for it to perform better or figure out all the different um, quarter cases where a model is lacking. So then, you know, you went from regression to tree-based methods and, and so on. But then the, the script kind of got flipped with language models where now we just compressed all this capacity and all this ability into these extremely large models and we just need to learn how to interface with them. So. Um, it kind of reinvigorated a bit of uh, passion for me within machine learning to think about, hey, now I really need to learn about the models themselves, understand the models and focus on that because, um, you know, we, we've really not fully tapped the potential for these and um, we're just figuring out ways in order to work with them better. So I, I almost think of fine tuning as a way of like, how do we interface and work with a model? Yeah, that's super cool, and that makes a lot of sense. And in that answer, we have received six questions, so I'm gonna I'm gonna start start asking through them. Um, first question is: uh, Does the task clustering mean that when I have, for example, a data set for fine tuning on a specific type of task in NLP, I should be mixing it with some existing data sets? Uh, you can do both. I would I would say um, with respect to task clustering. Um, you know, the, the punchline was more about um, diversifying the uh, data set that you actually want to be fine tuning on. So whether or not it's existing data sets or it's like brand new data sets that have a more diversity of applications, um, it's, uh, it's just better to have the uh, more clusters of tasks there. Um, a really good example, actually, um, that's kind of, come about in the community is the realization that if you use um, language data combined with coded uh, code data, the uh, symbolic mapping between the two helps improve its performance on both language tasks and coding tasks, which is actually kind of weird, right? In a way, 
you have these uh, these two ensembles of types of data to be combined together on your fine tuning process, and all of a sudden, it does better on both. So, yeah, um, yeah. yeah so it's that diversity of, of, of fine tuning training data that actually helps. Yeah, that's very interesting. It's 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 pretty surprising to hear, but very very cool stuff. Um, here's here's another question about uh, Langchain's auto evaluator. If if you're familiar with that tool, I, I haven't used that part of Langchain yet. But um, somebody's asking if you know about it. What about um, evaluating all the LLMs anybody's ever explored? For example, using um, Langchain auto auto evaluator. Uh, so unfortunately, I haven't really used Langchain's auto evaluator before. Um, but I mean, it sounds like a promising approach. Uh, the only caveat I would say is, um, you know, <laughs> time, I don't know what that'll look like. Yeah. This generation for these large language models is actually pretty difficult. And, and yeah. And, and evaluating them also is not a super clear cut thing that you can do yet. Like there's not, I mean, there are scores that people are coming out with, but there aren't very, very quantifiable metrics to, to measure which model is doing better, especially if you're just doing like a text generation task relative to, for example, like NER or, or, or text classification. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I certainly agree with that. And, um, you know, I, I sort of alluded to Helm as well. It, it, it you know, because I really, um, I was really excited about the, the whole release of it mostly because, um, one thing to note is that, you know, the Llama model released on Met, Met, by Meta was really important for the community. Um, but within their paper, there's kind of been criticism around the fact that they didn't release all the prompts that they yeah. uh, uh, benchmarked on. So it's not really an apples to apples comparison across um, how they performed, right? Because, you know, we all know from few shot learning that it, the prompts actually matter a lot in the exemplars that you provided. Right. Yeah, it's it's very interesting, and it makes me kind of wonder about what the state of prompts are going to be as as we advance. I mean, some people are are of the opinion that the largest models are just going to become so good at kind of intuiting what you're trying to get at that prompting is going to become less important. But obviously, there are people like far on the other side who think that you know being able to craft perfect prompts is 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 critical. So it'll be interesting to see how that develops. Um, we have another question that. I, I think it's going to be subjective, but it'll be interesting to hear your thoughts. Yeah. First part of this question is what costs are most important when you're looking at um, for using cloud platforms for these techniques? Obviously, maybe anything past kind of like per token or per character charges. And then somebody says, uh, which cloud is the best or maybe which cloud is your favorite if you're uh -huh. using the cloud providers um, to, to do these tasks? Yeah, um, that's a really good question. Uh, so... I mean, this sort of wooden, um, sort of data platform 101 in a way, or like when you're building a product is like, what's your data access pattern really going to look like? So with respect to large language models, um, the, the per token, uh, the per token cost is, is, is sort of important, but at the same time, you need to think about like, um, what are the access patterns that you expect over time from your customers? Um, if you're a semantic search company, uh, particularly like you're going to be hitting it much more often than you expect a certain latency out of it. Um, and then, uh, with respect, that's on the provider side, but then with respect to the clouds, um, that's a bit of a subjective question. Um, I think that, uh, it, it, it really just depends. I think it, it, it depends on what are the, the set of, uh, primitives that you expect out of your cloud providers. So like not every cloud provider uh, behaves um, the same with respect to the regional distribution. So like um, if you wanna, if, you, if you're really scaling really large, um, regional co-location of your GPUs is gonna be really important. And then uh, egress costs across data um, in order to facilitate the compute is also fairly important. So, um, and then just the bandwidth wiring. So. Um, if you really want the best of breed in terms of bandwidth, maybe you say, Hey, um, this might be unexpected, but maybe I want to go with Oracle because they have literally a wire that goes across for connecting your multi-node, uh, GPUs. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think it all depends. And, in at, at the very end of it, I think you should go what your goals are backwards. So if it's to rapidly iterate, maybe you choose the easiest cloud to work with from that standpoint. 
Yeah, that's a great answer. That's actually how I've been doing a lot of things recently. And I've been I've been loving using GCP. But that's, again, super subjective and, and totally dependent on the person. Um, here's a great one. Uh, I think another subjective one. But what um, vector database are you using right now? And I think a second part of that question is, do you even need a vector database to do LLM fine tuning? Uh, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> so I'll first talk about what we're using internally. Um, we haven't really established a particular vector database that we're going to be using. Um, you know, we've sort of played around with Pinecone and then some open source uh, uh, vector databases as well, su such as uh, Quadrant or even um, LandsDB. Is a is a new one that's coming out in the open source. Um, that's mostly to uh, try to achieve retrieval augmented uh, uh, language models, where that means like you know your language model is only trained up to a certain amount uh, of uh, certain update of data. So you know anything that happened within the last three weeks might actually not um, be encompassed in the knowledge of it. But then um, to do fine tuning. You don't really need a vector database, mostly because that's mostly to inject more context in and string together or cache context across different um, requests. Um, there is one aspect, though, that I'll say there looks uh, fine tuning and vector databases are considered separately. But um, as we clearly have become more sophisticated in our interfacing and usage of large language models, there's kind of a composability and caching aspect. Uh, within model routing that you would want to uh, leverage both a vector database and fine tuning to um, to 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 achieve like fairly complex use cases. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I've been um, I've experienced really similar things with the kind of dichotomy and then bringing them together. Um, cool. We have we have two more questions. I'm going to try to make sure I can interpret this question correctly. Um, but I, I think it's asking about when you're trying to find a reasoning path of a model when doing prompting or maybe when when kind of fine-tuning your prompts, um, is there a systematic way to get to this? For example, something like explainability. I think the broad question is, have you found systematic or, or reproducible ways to continuously make your model, your, your, your prompts better? Yeah, um, hmm, this is funny. Uh, to an extent, uh... There's a lot in the uh, open community and in research that's come out probably within the last three months about this. Um, I'd alluded to self-instruct before. Um, there's one type of, uh, I would call it kind of post-processing that's used commonly. So what self-instruct uses is self-consistency within there. So what you do is actually you generate, um, you resample the model 10 times and then you find uh, which answers occur the most frequently, and then you actually go backwards. So then you take those answers, you don't know whether or not they're correct, and then you select the reasoning paths that correspond to the most common answer or the most frequent answer there to select your reasoning paths. So it's kind of going backwards there. Um, that is one type of reasoning path selection um, within our, our research team, we're actually, uh, exploring more methods to improve those too, as well. Cause that's kind of a, um, a very simplistic approach to that, but, uh, you can kind of ensemble those things together into like an actual pipeline for figuring out how do you approach explainability and reasoning for these models. How have you guys been doing things to manage cost? If you're, for example, for every kind of input, you're calling the model, if I understood correctly, you're calling the model 10 times, um, with any given input, do you have, yeah, I guess, ways to manage cost when, you, when you're doing those kinds of experiments? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, there's there's a few knobs on terms of that. And I think everybody's probably also um, uh, seen that within working with OpenAI. Um, the temperature setting can actually help you, like increasing the temperature increases the diversity of the outputs. Um, and therefore, you can probably uh, mini batch some of your generations that way. So increasing temperature and then uh, causing it to sample out and generate more reasoning paths that way. And then we've also uh, figured, um, sort of played around with different types of uh, batching mechanisms that we want to use within that. Um, but I think, as you said, it's sort of an open question. I think inference is the main problem that's on everybody's mind with respect to these language models, because it's one thing to say, I can get a good quality 
set of results and evaluations out of it. But it's another thing to say, like, this is going to cost me a hundred times more than just doing a query on a, a, on a regular traditional database. Yeah. I'm curious if you think, or if you have any ideas on, you know, now, now with, with Claude having a hundred thousand so in a uh, context window and, and even with GPT-4 having a 32,000 context window, um, do you think that these larger companies are ever going to offer, for example, monthly fees or um, do anything other than per token charging? Ooh, that is a, that's a real interesting question. Um, you know, as a business, we sort of thought about that as well. Like, you know, the token is their version of consumption-based pricing to an extent. Um, I think it actually is just going to truly, to me, I kind of think about it in terms of first principles uh, with respect to the hardware. So the innovations in hardware will actually unlock the unit economics that are going to be important for us uh, in the future. So um, a good example to me that I say is if tomorrow a 200 gigabyte uh, GPU card existed, <laughs> a lot of the a lot of the the sharding and the offloading and the tricks that we've sort of employed won't actually be as relevant. Uh, right. say, for instance, you know, I already know that as human beings, we're going to get a 200 gigabyte card, and then now we're going to just want to have a hundred trillion parameter model. Right, right. <laughs> That way, and then we have to go back to sharding them and stuff like that. But yeah, in terms of the pricing and unit economics, um, I do see it as possible, but fundamentally, I'd have to see either changes in the way that hardware um, can be used for those use cases, as well as innovations in the research to be able to unlock those unit economics. Cool. And uh, I think for our last question, I'll la leave it with, uh, I think, a very fundamental question that you've probably been asked a, a bunch of times and probably enjoy answering, which is, um, when do you prefer, when, when you're at entering a new task, how do you decide when you should fine tune versus prompting with a context window? Ah, that's a really fundamental and interesting question. Um, I think within that it's, uh, it's a real question and I fundamentally come back to, you know, one of the slides that I was on. Um, if you really want domain expertise, if you really want a model to be much more performant and, and possibly in terms of you're talking about unit economics and cost. Like if you want more zero shot learning out of it, then you really want to fine tune it. Um, and also, uh, if there's a set of, uh, expertise that isn't necessarily embedded into the model or the pre-trained model already, um, you really do need to fine tune it. But with respect to prompting there, are uh, you know, the whole beauty in the whole argument of one model to rule it all was the fact that you can expose the capabilities embedded in the model um, itself just through providing it the linguistic and uh, language for it to perform the task. So um, when I kind of look at both of those, it's like a evaluation on, you know, how is it performing for the things that I actually care about? And then uh, then going backwards and saying, is that viable for me to... Um, to support on a cost basis, um, or, or do I just need zero shot out of multiple? Yeah. Awesome. That was a very elegant answer. Um, very well thought. Um, well, I think those are all the questions. Perfect timing. Uh, Mark, thanks so much for coming on. Thanks for everybody for listening. Um, I, this is really awesome. And I'll just once again, drop the link in the chat. If you have the ability, uh, you should come to the conference. We're going to have a lot more talks like this. Plenty of people, awesome learnings and great networking opportunity. Um, but yeah, Mark, thanks so much for coming on.